Hello and welcome back to day three of our online conference. Uh, we're so glad uh, you have been able to join us again for our final talk of the week uh, before our Q&A panel tomorrow. Today we're joined by Cara who will be speaking to us about challenges in community-based conservation. We are live today. I know yesterday wasn't, but today we are live. So don't forget to join in with us uh, by asking questions uh, during Cara's talk so I can present them to her at the end. You can do this by using one of our social media platforms, which you can see above, or uh, as many of you did on Monday, if you uh, type in the conversations and any questions on the YouTube channel chat, that's a really easy way for me to see those questions as well. If we aren't able to ask all of those questions today, I will be saving them for our Q&A session uh, tomorrow. So don't worry uh, if your question isn't used, we'll make sure we get those, those asked at some point this week. Um, as always, we hope there are no technical difficulties. Um, if we do lose Cara to internet issues, uh, please don't uh, w worry, we have a backup for that, but we hope the internet won't be lost. Um, but if it is, just stick with us, bear with us. Uh, we do have a backup, which we hope we won't need today. Um, and finally, I'm just gonna pray for Cara before she shares her message uh, with us today. Father, thank you for Cara and the opportunities you have given her to work with people across the world. We ask that you give her peace as she speaks today and that Cara's internet will work for the entire duration of today's meeting. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Wonderful, thanks. I will share my screen. We can start. Wonderful. Uh, hi everyone, thanks for logging in today. Um, I'm Cara Perret, and I'm so glad to be able to talk to you today about some of the challenges that I've faced as a marine biologist in community-based conservation and how our Christian faith might be able to speak into some of those challenges. At the outset, I'd like to acknowledge that this might not be a field of science that you're, you're very close to or can personally relate to, and so it might feel a bit removed from your context. But what you'll find about this topic is that it has something to say to those environmental responsibilities and anxieties that I'm sure we all face. And it also deals with our interactions with others, especially where opinions and contexts differ. Uh, so I do hope you'll find some of the themes uh, resonate with you today. Okay, let's dive straight in. Uh, firstly, who am I? Um, I'm Cara, I'm from South Africa, born and raised. And as soon as I was 18, I made a beeline for Cape Town uh, to study marine biology and oceanography at the University of Cape Town, alongside some pretty awesome neighbors. I was then lucky enough to get my first job in the field uh, in the tropical waters of the Maldives, leading a marine conservation project there for a year. Here our work focused on rehabilitating sea turtles that have been kept illegally as pets, coral restoration through monitoring and coral gardening, and then community engagement and environmental education more broadly. And what better setting is there? <laughs> it's idyllic, right? Uh, here I faced one of the most rewarding and beautiful years of my life, but also one of the toughest. Looking at these beautiful photos, you must think I'm crazy uh, for talking about tough times. Um, so first, I'm going to build a better picture for you by zooming out and explaining the Maldivian context in which we're working, both below and above the surface. The Maldives is an island state in the Indian Ocean, and it's made up of 26 atolls. And when we zoom in on an atoll, which is a ring of coral islands, you'll see that the Maldives is made up of uninhabited islands, the luxurious resort islands, which we probably most associate with the Maldives, and local islands. We were based on a local island, a community very different to that on the resorts in terms of their lifestyle, their daily pressures, and also their relationship with the ocean. As an island state, the country is made up of lots of small communities. So the island that we were based on was home to 4,000 people. It took about 
40 minutes to walk around the entire island. And the average height above sea level of the entire country is 1.2 meters. So, so they live incredibly close to the ocean in more ways than one. And as such, they live quite a dependent and basic lifestyle, which is strongly affected by things like power cuts, delayed deliveries, or natural forces like monsoons and tsunamis. Living on a small sand island in the middle of the ocean, they have no access to soil in which to grow their produce. And their only source of water is rain collection, mostly during the monsoon season, um, and desalination and bottled water that they bring in. They are subsistence fishermen and the main industry on our island was fishing. And the state uh, religion is Islam. And this creates further deviances from the typical resort life in terms of permitted diet, dress codes, and behaviors to do with things like the call to prayer and the holy month of Ramadan. This mosque in particular is on the capital island called Marley. So this context, which is so very different to anything I'd ever experienced before, had part how we were going to approach environmental work here. For example, island communities have very established ways of life, and this can make it harder to gain respect as a foreigner, particularly with the older generation uh, where there's also a language barrier. Um, and this is probably understandable, right, given the amount of local wisdom and knowledge that they have and I don't. Having lived uh, off the ocean for hundreds of years, there's also a sense of environmental complacency, which doesn't conceive of the ocean no longer providing for them. And this is, is quite hard to work with. Being such a small community, most people on the island were either friends or related. And so this can make law enforcement for some of the smaller environmental crimes uh, virtually non-existent. As an isolated community, they also had very different priorities to my own environmental agenda. For example, things like expansion, infrastructure development, and money were some of the key drivers in their decision making. And having lived off the ocean and being subsistence fishermen, they also had very different cultural norms to those that I was used to. For example, things like animal welfare or harvesting from the ocean. Now, all these points and others impact how a community is gonna to respond to someone like me arriving to run an environmental program. The community were so wonderful to us, um, but when I reflect on the work in particular, it is safe to say that engaging with humanity was far more challenging and multi-dimensional than my textbook knowledge had prepared me for. The conditions were challenging, the work was constant, and the community can feel quite hard to reach. But the human dimension is arguably one of the most important aspects of conservation work. And yet I was unprepared for the types of questions that it was going to raise for me. Firstly, questions of motivation. Is this work even worthwhile? Are the blood, sweat and tears actually working towards something meaningful? Secondly, questions of guidance. How do you approach, respect, and educate a culture that's so different to your own? Do you even have a right to? And how do you, how do you make people care enough that they turn knowledge into the sort of sacrificial change that's required to care for future generations or other species? Now, in the pressure of the role, I didn't think about these questions very deeply while I was out there. It was actually two years later uh, when I joined the Faraday Institute for Science and Religion in Cambridge, where I was first encouraged to take these questions seriously through the lens of my Christian faith. Oh, I forgot one. <laughs> Apologies. Uh, the third aspect of questioning that, that I, I faced when I was out there was at the end when how do you keep going when the, um, 
progress just seems so slow. The, pro the problem seems so large and um, promising signs are quite rare. Apologies. On motivation, um, I now believe that the main motivating um, ideas revolve around our core beliefs, that God values creation, imparting an intrinsic value on everything he has made. And creation praises God, not just humans, the whole of creation praises God. Praise is not restricted to humans alone. There's something about the beauty and intricate functionality of a healthy ecosystem which praises its maker. And we're thus degrading this praise by breaking down these systems. Thirdly, the Bible commands stewardship right from the beginning. And finally, I think we should feel compelled to ease the suffering of our neighbors worldwide who are negatively affected by environmental exploitation. Looking at these points, I'm convinced that caring for God's world is an important discipleship calling that we should all be taking very seriously. However, I'm gonna move on fairly quickly from this point. So if we wanna revisit it, then maybe the Q&A would be a good uh, time for that. What I hope to address for the rest of my talk are those additional layers of questioning. Does our Christian faith go further than just motivation? Does Christian discipleship actually equip us to do this work and respond to the issues that it raises? God actually used um, my secular guest lectures in Cambridge University to unlock this discussion of Christian guidance. Uh, after presenting the students with the Maldivian context, as I have done briefly for you, we would then brainstorm how best to approach a community like this with an environmental message. And we would often converge on similar themes year on year. Firstly, integration. Conservation outreach cannot be done at a distance. You need to integrate and build trust to help the community engage with you and over time engage with what you're saying. This can be as simple as learning the language in the Maldives. Even when you get it wrong, you can bond over them laughing at you. Um, things like joining family meals, um, joining community activities, even if that means eating very spicy bait fish <laughs> straight from the ocean, bones and all. Secondly, education is powerful because it's essential to discuss the importance of healthy ecosystems for their livelihood. But at the same time, knowledge alone is not enough to change people's environmental actions. Each community has different values, different needs, and different abilities. And so first, it's actually more important to learn and to build an understanding. You can't hope to suggest any sort of long-term solution if you don't understand their pressures and their priorities. And this requires non-judgmental learning as you build a picture of what it's like to live in their shoes. And this point also links with integration because you'll learn as you live alongside them. Alongside education, it's also powerful to practice what you preach by acting. Even if it's countercultural, they may look at you weirdly, but something about your actions will speak loudly and your efforts to serve the community and their environment will not go unnoticed. For example, in the Maldives, they have quite a waste management problem, as you can imagine, living on a tiny island. And uh, we would clean the beach for quite a while with spectators before any of the locals um, started to join us over time. And this leads to my final point, which is perseverance. Community-based conservation really is about the long game. It takes time to build trust and for your good intentions to start bearing any sort of fruit. And I also think perseverance builds a level of respect as you go through the highs and lows with the community. Things like weddings and festivals, but also sickness and hospital visits. As you persevere in each one of these aspects, they become more winsome. New Testament scholar, Dr. Douglas Moo, says that the solution to the ecological crisis we face is a transformation in human values. Looking at these points, you can see how true that is. 
but also how intimidating a challenge that is for a scientist hoping that effort and education alone will be enough of a toolbox to inspire change in communities. But as Christians, we are not strangers to working with the complexities and resistances of the human heart. Bob Sluker, who's a lead scientist at Arusha, which is a Christian conservation organization, he was the first person to introduce me to the synergy between conservation and Christian evangelism. Addressing a room of secular conservation scientists in the David Attenborough building in Cambridge, he said to them, in a way, you are evangelists too. Dead quiet. <laughs> you have a message you believe is important, knowledge you believe should change how people live, and you face obstacles as you try and help the people you are approaching. I think he's right that there seem to be strong ties between the practical requirements of Christian evangelism and community conservation outreach. And this comparison means that we have a rich bank of biblical guidance to draw on. But more importantly, we also have the perfect example to follow. Jesus was the ultimate evangelist and changer of hearts. He came to a resistant world with a message of truth which compelled a change in people's values. And I think we have a lot to learn about how to reach communities by how Jesus approached us. Greg Ogden remarks that Jesus's own disciple-making pattern was to be intimately involved with others and allow life to rub against life. Jesus showed the ultimate and most unbelievable integration into our context, humbling himself to take on human likeness and linking integration to humility. Secondly, Hebrews comforts us that as Christians, we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet he did not sin. Through full integration into our context, Jesus understands that context and he responds with empathy. When Jesus went ashore, he saw a large crowd and he felt compassion for them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. And he began to teach them many things. I'm drawn to Jesus's teaching resulting from compassion. And I think this can challenge our motivations and approach as in conservation, it can be easy to feel quite self-righteous and driven by a personal ambition. Jesus spent his time on earth in service to others. For even the son of man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. I think we have a lot to learn about linking action to service rather than expecting the community to serve us. Mark tells us that feeling sorrowful and troubled before his crucifixion, Jesus prayed, Abba Father, everything is possible for you. Take this cup from me, yet not what I will, but what you will. Jesus persevered in his work on earth amongst people who misunderstood and often hated him. And yet he persevered for them all the way to death. Now, of course, we're gonna fall short of Jesus's perfect standards, but I, I hope you find it a helpful parallel to make because if we appreciate that the character that Jesus modeled equips us for all ministry, then it leads to a rich source of guidance for Christian conservationists wondering how to do this work that is set before us. And this can be applied to any ministry that you find yourself in. But the final section of hope and endurance when things seem too tough. Even when we're equipped with God's motivating mandate and Jesus's winsome example and the armor of the spirit, it can be hard to endure in ministry work in a broken world when we ourselves are broken too. What of those times when it's hard to persevere through the setbacks and perhaps even failures? 
Perhaps you feel a similar tendency to despair when you think about the world and the global challenges and threats that are facing it. So I've talked to Christian conservationists who have a lot of experience living up, out this discipleship calling as a career. And I found their reflections so helpful. So I'm gonna summarize a few of them in this final section. All the Christian conservationists that I spoke to spoke about facing feelings of anxiety, frustration, and even a sense of deep personal loss and powerlessness in their work. Simon, who's a director at Synchronicity Earth, framed it like this. I believe that caring for God's creation is one aspect of Christian ministry, but is it any different from any other form of Christian ministry in terms of the sadness, pains, and apparent failure that often accompanies it? Isn't this part of what it means to be a disciple in a fallen world? Again, this recognition of creation care as an aspect of Christian ministry provides it a framework to help us discuss the section of hope and endurance further. Similarly, Peter and the late Miranda Harris, who founded Arosha, have found in Christian conservation the deep echoes of the character of pastoral work. For example, in pastoral work, you're sometimes called simply to sit at the bedside of a dying friend. But how does this resonance between creation care and pastoral care help us to respond to that temptation to despair? Firstly, Jeremy Linzel, who works at Arosha, reminds us that Christians are not adhering to a system of thought, but clinging to a relationship. A Christian's relationship with God means there's someone to whom I can take those things that cause me anxiety, despair, and bereavement. Peter and Miranda add to this, saying, we have tried to find ways to persist in good work against a tide of rising destruction. We have to find those ways from the heart of our relationship with a loving God. In the Bible, we have a long record of people clinging to their relationship with God through hard times. There are resources of lament and even outrage in many scriptures that give language to those feelings. However, they establish a trajectory of final hope for creation that rests not in our efforts, but in God's willingness and commitment to redemption and salvation. And for me, this seems key, that Christians find our encouragement not in our success rate, but in the character and promises of God. And this is our source of hope and endurance. Jeremy Linzel finds hope in the way the Bible so clearly identifies our broken relationship with creation as a sign of the fall, our human rebellion against God. But we know that God has a salvation plan to reverse the fall. And so the ultimate redeeming solution actually lies in Jesus's all accomplishing death on the cross. And this knowledge can help ease the crippling weight of setbacks that we may feel but it does not give us an excuse to stop trying. We are called to cooperate in God's intended work being done on earth as it is in heaven. Pastor and theologian Diedrich Bonhoeffer wrote from prison that it may be the case that the day of judgment will dawn tomorrow. In that case, we shall gladly stop working for a better future, but not before. In the book, Creation and Crisis, theologian Jonathan Moo says, there is no more reason for Christians to give up caring appropriately for the earth than there is for them to give up praying, pursuing virtue, proclaiming the gospel, or helping the poor. All such activity finds its ultimate fulfillment in the complete realization of the new creation, but its value and importance in the present is not thereby diminished. It is in fact the future hope reaching back into the present that lends all work done in the Lord its true weight and significance. And finally, 1 Corinthians sums it up like this. Those who are in Christ 
are expected to bear witness by their lives and their actions to God's inbreaking kingdom, trusting that God's faithfulness to his creatures and to his creation means that their labor will not be in vain. For conservationists, our work is not only important when we're successful. We continue as in ministry because we hope that our character and our desire to fight brokenness for his glory reflect something of our Lord. And so I found it incredibly fruitful to explore the challenges and struggles of conservation in light of motivation from the Bible, guidance from evangelism, and wisdom from pastoral care. And I hope these links can be helpful uh, beyond conservation as we face challenges and human interaction across all the sciences. Um, thank you. Amazing, thank you so much, Cara. Um, we have got some questions uh, on their way in. If you um, have not uh, written in a question yet and you're desperate to, uh, or not even desperate to, if you have a question and you, and you you'd be interested in knowing what the answer is from Cara, uh, please uh, send those in now. If you're watching on YouTube, it's a really good uh, one to comment in on because uh, that's the one I'm going to be observing uh, the most. Um, I really liked your message about kind of working with others in whatever situation we're placed in and, and the calling we have to do that, whether that's in con conservation work or wherever we're working. So um, I found that really mm -hmm. encouraging. Um, the first question um, was about uh, the fact that you're working in a predominantly Muslim country. Um, mm -hmm. And the question says, how are you able to relate uh, to their faith uh, and doing what you're doing. So were you um, using their own faith to to encourage them in terms of looking after creation or were you bringing your Christian perspective or maybe a combination of the two? That's a really good question. And it's one that I wish I'd thought about and wrestled with before I went out there. Because to be honest, it would have been incredibly fruitful to engage with their faith more because I know the Muslim faith has a lot to say about creation care. And at that point uh, in my career, to be honest, I don't think I'd even made very productive links between my Christian faith and my work. And so it wasn't on my mind as much as it is now. I kind of wish I could go back <laughs> and do it all again. Um, so that's the unfortunate answer, but it is most definitely the way to go to understand where their priorities are, where their mindset is, a level, a playing field where you can approach them. Um, and so it's something I should have, um, I should have engaged with more, but unfortunately how, I didn't. How would you do it differently if you were to go back to that then? How would you approach that um, if you were in the same situation again or a similar situation? To be honest, I think I'd sit down and ask them to t teach me and tell me. I don't think, I think I found, felt a little bit intimidated, to be honest, kind of broaching um, their Muslim faith, um, just because it's so predominant in the whole community and I'm, I'm quite ignorant um, of it. And so I don't think, yeah, I made that space available for them to actually just sit down and teach me and say, what actually do you believe? Um, and so that's the first thing I would go to is, yeah, just sit down in a safe space and help ask them uh, to feed back to me, yeah, what they think. Yeah, I think we can very easily be scared to ask others about what they believe, scared to be preached at in the same way that others could be scared of us being Christians and what we're going to say to them. So um, I think it's important to remember everyone's human. And I think you've put that point across really well. Um, Going more onto the line of conservation work, um, how mm. how do you see conservation work changing in the coming years? You mentioned that the people uh, you were working with live only a meter, a meter, one point two meters above <laughs> sea level, um, and obviously yeah. there are some big concerns about the environment and rising sea levels. Um, mm. So, what do you think the impact will be where you were working, as well as kind of the overall change in conservation work over the coming years? I mean, it'll be huge, um, especially for a community like that. And one of the, the good things for conservation is the fact that the resorts are so um, active in the Maldives because they have 
let's say, a vested interest in keeping their reefs healthy, the environment clean, because that's their draw for tourists. And so we were the only program that was running from a local island. There are quite a few conservation organizations running from the resorts. And I think they were actually able to do a lot more um, because of just the type of people that were coming to the resorts um, and that, that sort of mindset. So they've been doing great things. I mean, when we were there, it was, it was still legal to dig up turtle nests and to eat all the eggs. Um, and it was actually through lobbying over quite some years um, that that's now uh, been made illegal. So they are making steps and the resort um, conservation projects are doing a lot, but I don't know how much they're doing in terms of countrywide benefits, um, things like climate change and um, I mean, all the, tourists who come have to fly in. <laughs> and I think that's an elephant in the room that they probably haven't, haven't um, talked about much. Um, but in terms of reef care and animal care, um, they're doing a lot. Great, that's good to hear. And I imagine that's a, an even bigger issue than you can even start to start to discuss today. Um, yeah. We've got one more question uh, today. If you have any other questions, please send those in. We can, we can present them to Cara and the rest of the panel tomorrow. Um, but what advice do you have for us at the moment for looking after the environment in our current situation where many of us are working at home? Um, I, yeah. I imagine there's going to be a lot coming up in the news about no one flying and, and obviously that having an impact on, on, on the world. But um, what can we still be doing when it feels some of us might be feeling helpless being at home? Yeah, yeah that's a really good question because when I've thought about this before, it's definitely not been from within a quarantine <laughs> isolation sort of situation. And, and in those kind of moments, um, I mean, it's, it's so hard to do everything. And there's such conflicting messages about the right thing to do. So it can feel really intimidating. Um, but some, when I speak to conservation organizations, most of them want to try and point people to those, those higher levels of actions. So that's um, getting things through Parliament for, for cleaner businesses, kind of large scale things um, based on who you vote for, what's important to them, and kind of the country level actions um, that can be can can be sought through through those. Um, on a personal level, um, it's not it's not about denying yourself everything and shutting yourself away in a bubble. But I do think the reduction in in flying is going to do amazing things for our, our planet, and so even if that's just on our mind in the future, whether that cuts down our flying just a little bit or we choose to offset uh, the longer flights where we can, those are all things that I think are within our power to do. Um, red meat is another one of the things that we can easily cut back on. And now that we're spending so much time thinking about what we're gonna buy, it might be a good time to reflect on what, we, what we're used to eating and how we can get away with just a little bit less red meat. Uh, each week it makes a big difference great thank you very much and i know that that could come up with even more questions that that are along those lines which we may get tomorrow uh which would be great for us to discuss in more detail um before we go today uh, just one final reminder about tomorrow so we've got our question and answer panel we've got cara dave and rhoda all joining us um if you are watching this on catch up please uh send in your questions uh, for any of the panel or for, for for several of them uh to all be asked these questions um we would love as much interaction from you tomorrow as possible it will be easier for us if we have those questions in advance so as you're watching this get those questions written down send them to us through social media or comment on our youtube channel please uh, get those to us um and the final thing was for friday uh, we are doing stories that you are sending in in response to this so anything about your own workplace that you want to share about your own experiences or any challenges or difficulties you've faced if you can uh, send in those um, as well you might want to write it as a paragraph um, if you want some help sending that in maybe as a short video uh, just just let me know and I can give you a hand doing that over the next couple of days uh, before Friday. Uh, so thank you once again for tuning in. Uh, thank you again to Cara uh, for the message she's brought today um, and I hope you can all join us tomorrow for our question and answer panel. Thank you. Bye.